So in this final video, we're going to talk through the control function model. This is going to be a different way to solve the same kind of endogeneity issue that we talked through with BLP. It might actually be applicable in some, some other situations where BLP doesn't quite work, though, and we'll talk about that. So we can think about this control function approach as being kind of like the opposite of BLP. The BLP approach was to use instruments to isolate exogenous variation in our, uh, in our endogenous variables. Uh, so, so basically isolating exogenous price variation. What the control function approach is going to do is essentially control for the endogeneity within price. And so why might this approach be better than BLP? We just spent a lot of time covering BLP. Why don't we just use that? Well. Uh, a control function can be used if market shares are zero. Uh, trying to estimate those delta terms in BLP is not going to work. They're just not identified if any market shares equal zero. Also, with BLP, uh, we talked through having kind of market product level instruments. Well, a control function is going to actually be able to control for ind individual level endogeneity rather than just that kind of market level endogeneity from BLP. Um, and the issue with BLP there is that individual specific constant terms just are not identified. And then finally, the control function approach is not going to require that contraction mapping algorithm that, that you might have gotten lost as I tried to talk through. So um, uh, just for computational reasons uh, or, or just kind of coding reasons, it might be easier to use uh, this control function instead of BLP. So the model we're going to start from here is that the utility that consumer N obtains from product J is shown here. It's going to be, we're going to think about it as being once again, kind of representative utility V plus some unobserved utility epsilon. But now representative utility is going to depend on uh, some endogenous variable Y. Um, you can think about Y as being P from BLP, but, but we uh, calling it Y here just, just to be more general. And we've got some exogenous variables x and then finally uh, individual specific uh, coefficients beta. Well, let's also go ahead and model our endogenous explanatory variable y as some function of some exogenous instruments z and some parameters gamma that will relate y and z to each other. And then we're going to have this other, another error term mu the, 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 uh, are like the unobserved factors that affect y. Let's think of it that way. Okay, so we've got utility as a function of y, x, beta, and epsilon. y is a function of z, gamma, and mu. Okay, let's make two assumptions related to our epsilon and our mu. Let's first assume that epsilon and mu are correlated. If epsilon and mu are correlated, then epsilon and y are also correlated. And so y is endogenous. That's the whole problem here, is that y is endogenous. So we, I just wanted to kind of show you where that kind of endogeneity could come from. It would come from epsilon and mu being correlated. But let's also assume that epsilon and mu are independent of z. If they're independent of z, then that means Z is going to be able to serve as a good instrument or good instruments if it's, if it's more than one. So that's great. Now, what are we going to do? Well, as is often the case, let's decompose something. Let's decompose our epsilon, our unobserved utility, into two terms. A conditional mean, where that is the conditional mean conditional on the value of mu. So if epsilon and mu are correlated, one way of saying that is that this expectation does not equal zero. Just kind of definitionally, if things are correlated, this is going to not equal zero. So let's split out that conditional mean and then let epsilon tilde here be deviations from that mean. So we're going to have a conditional mean and then how things deviate from that conditional mean. Well, just by construction, these epsilon tildes are not correlated with mu because all of the correlation is basically subsumed into this conditional expectation term. 
So if epsilon tilde is not correlated with mu, then it's also not correlated with y. And so if we can get our model to the place where the error term is an epsilon tilde instead of an epsilon, then we've solved our endogeneity problem. And that's what we're going to try to do. And so essentially, another way of thinking about that is we're going to control for this conditional mean. We're going to control for the source of endogeneity. And that's going to fix our problem. So what we do is we construct this function that we'll call a control function. We'll denote it as CF for control function that equals that conditional mean. And we'll, we'll use that to control for the conditional mean. It's going to be a function of mu and some parameters called lambda. What's often done, or what's the easiest thing to do at least, is just assume that that control function is linear. So that control function just equals lambda times mu. We could think about having higher order terms. We could even lump some other stuff in there. But, uh, but, but for now, we are just going to, or you know, what, what, oftentimes it's just expressed as this linear function. So now let's substitute that in, right? That was the epsilon term. We, we decomposed epsilon into two terms, our control function and this epsilon tilde. So now we can write the utility that consumer N obtains from product J as our representative utility plus our control function plus our epsilon tilde. And remember, now that epsilon tilde is our unobserved random you know, uh, utility component, it is not correlated with Y. So now we can call Y exogenous instead of endogenous, essentially because we've, we've controlled for the source of endogeneity through this control function. I wanna point out, we have to specify this control function correctly. If it's not specified correctly and we don't fully control for endogeneity, then this isn't gonna work. But if we think we have a good control function that controls for endogeneity, then we've solved our uh, endogeneity problem. So we need to make two distributional assumptions here. One is, is the one we're used to, one's, one's not. We need to make a, an assumption about the conditional density of epsilon tilde. So how does epsilon tilde, uh, how is that distributed conditional on mu? Everything we're saying about epsilon here is gonna end up being conditional on mu. So we need this density conditional density rather. And then we just have to make some assumption about a density for beta sub n, just like we have in the past with mixed logit. So then we can write down choice probabilities like we have here at the bottom. Um, just uh, kind of the, the same kind of choice probability we're used to. It's just that now we have to integrate over both a conditional density of epsilon tilde and a density of beta. So we've got this double integral instead of just one integral. Uh, so obviously we can simulate these choice probabilities, but there's one problem. We don't actually know mu. Mu is an unobserved component and it factors importantly into our control function. So what do we do? Well, we're gonna end up using two steps to estimate this model. In the first step, we're gonna estimate mu's or really mu hats by regressing y on z. And the residual, just a simple OLS regression, and the residual of that regression is going to be our mu. If we, if we look back to, uh, uh, to, the, to the model we wrote down, mu is just the residual from that kind of regression. Once we have those mu hats, our estimated mu's, we can uh, now construct the choice probabilities we talked about. We can simulate those choice probabilities and use them within a maximum simulated likelihood framework to estimate our theta hats and our lambda hats that get us the parameters of the model that we're interested in. So I didn't write out all the math for this, but, but I think maybe you can see how, how things would kind of map to what we already talked about. There is an alternative approach we could take here, and that's going to be kind of like with, with the GMM version of, of, uh, of BLP, is instead of actually estimating this thing in two steps, we can estimate it simultaneously in one step. But that's going to require that instead of specifying a conditional distribution of epsilon, we need to specify the joint distribution of epsilon and mu. So we have to make a stronger assumption there 
But if we think we can correctly specify that joint distribution, then we can simultaneously estimate this entire model and that simultaneous approach is gonna be more efficient. So we kind of have two options here. Uh, I talked through the one that's gonna be kind of easier uh, easier to achieve, but, but if you think you know something about that joint distribution, you could use this alternative method instead. Uh, and, and the textbook has more information on that, which I'll point you to if you want the details on this alternative approach. So that's all I have. Uh, I know this was a long set of videos this week. Thanks for sticking with me and, and getting through them all. I hope that, that you find in the future that having seen a, a, a brief treatment of this material is useful. I'm sure you will run into all of these things in, in, in future research that you do and maybe just at least having a little bug in the back of your mind about them from, from this class will, will help them go easier the next time you see them. Uh, so, like I said, that's all I've got. Uh, and I will uh, th thanks for sticking through these videos and for the whole course. Take care, everyone.